Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So we're going to be reading from uh, the Science of Self-Realization, uh, Chapter 6. <clears throat> There's a um, subtitle in that chapter. It is uh, called The Tiny World of Modern Science. So I'll be reading from that and then be giving some, some commentary. Um, I, I'm not sure. I guess I could share a screen um, unless people want to just you know, pull it up themselves. I'm trying to remember. It's been so long since I did the share screen. Here, here we go. I'll try that. <clears throat> and that share. All right, can everybody see that? Yes, no. yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll be, I'll be reading from this, um, The Tiny World of Modern Science. During the morning walk of April of 1973 at Venice Beach, Los Angeles, she discusses modern science and its high priest. Quote, <clears throat> they claim to have millions of dollars worth of knowledge, but if you ask them a question, they simply give you a post-dated check. Why should we receive it? Or why should we accept it? They cannot even produce a spear of grass through their biological or chemical experiments. Nonetheless, they are claiming that the creation is produced by some chemical or biological method. Why does no one question all these, not all this nonsense? So, <clears throat> unquote. So Shil Prabhupada gets in the pretty much question and answer period. Uh, later on, we'll see some uh, questions coming from Dr. Singh. They, these are old standard questions that were posed uh, back in 73, but we see these things uh, still apply now. And we can actually relate a lot of these things about modern science as we um, are going through this current state of, of chaos uh, globally. So a lot of these things apply and I'll try to see if I can make a connection to it. Okay, sure problem, but the whole role of science and technology is running on the false idea that life is born from matter. We cannot allow this nonsensical theory to go unchallenged. Life does not come from matter. Matter is generated from life. This is not a theory, it's a fact. Science is based on an incorrect theory. Therefore, all its calculations and conclusions are wrong and people are suffering because of this. When all these mistake, mistaken modern scientific theories are corrected, people will become happy. So we must challenge the scientists and defeat them. Otherwise, they will mislead the entire society. So, you know, based on that, <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada is talking, I was thinking heavily on the uh, Ayurvedic medicine, how those things are based on a spiritual science, or you can even say um, uh, metaphysical uh, science, uh, Sankhya philosophy, because the process of the Sankhya philosophy is to try to understand um, matter and spirit and how the one is a tool or an instrument of the other. So obviously we are all souls. So the material and energy is supposed to be used uh, in the vein of a tool. Um, just like if you're building a house, you need hammer, nails, wood, so forth and so on, et cetera, et cetera. So the body is in the same fashion, but here, should Prabhupada is, is indicating that science has it all backwards. Um, and not necessarily all backwards. They don't even identify the soul is the primary seat of the body, which is running all the activities of the body. We'll go on. Matter changes in six phases, birth, growth, maintenance, production of byproducts, dwindling and death. But the life within matter the spirit soul is eternal. 
It goes through no such changes. Life appears to be developing and decaying, but actually it is simply passing through each of these six phases until material body can no longer be maintained. Then the old body dies and the soul enters a new body. When our clothes or when our clothing is old and worn, we can change it. Similarly, by one day, our bodies become old and useless and we pass on to a new body. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita 2.13, Dehi no Ashman Yata Dehe, Kaumuran Yavananjara, Tata Dihantara Pratye, Diras Tatra Yumuyati. Quote, as the body, as the embodied soul continuously passes in this body, from boyhood to youth, old age, the soul similarly passes onto another body at the time of death. Unquote. And then he says, and and a a uh, little later in 218, This means that only the material body of the indestructible and eternal entity is subject to destruction. This material body is perishable, but the life within the body is nitya, eternal. According to the Vedas, the measurement of the soul within the body is one ten thousandth part of the tip of the hair. This is very small. In fact, it is atomic. And Prabhupada also refers to the soul as subatomic. <clears throat> Yet because of that atomic spiritual energy, my body is working. It is so difficult to understand. Suppose a man thinks himself very stout and strong. Why is he stout and strong? Only because within his body is a small spiritual spark. But as soon as the spiritual spark is gone, his body dies and his strength and vigor become void. If scientists say that matter is the cause of the origin of life, then let them bring just one dead man back to life by injecting him with chemicals. But this cannot, this they cannot do. So I'll stop there for a minute. Um, I've always used this particular argument, even when I've given classes in the prison. And one thing that I always used to say to drive this point home, if you take two dead bodies in the morgue and you set up wine, soft lighting, maybe a candlelight dinner. Um, and you leave a, a dead body of a male and a dead body of female. If you leave them overnight the next morning, um, they will produce nothing. And nine months later, they won't produce anything. Um, so the scientists are apt to believe that they can produce things from matter. But what they fail to understand, even if it's chemicals, there's still a life force even in the chemicals. We even see this when uh, the body, a dead body is decaying. The nails still grow, hair still grows because there's other living entities in the body. So they confuse this with, with thinking that, oh, it's just chemicals. So this is a form of impersonalism. And so, we have to understand things as they are, um, as Prabhupada calls it a post, post dated, you know, maybe in the future we'll be able to figure these things out. And Prabhupada has even said that if you want to produce something, you need to start from scratch. You can't even use the ingredients already given by, by Krishna. So they can't even produce raw materials. So this whole idea is a cheating idea. I'll take something from nature that God has already provided, and then I try to produce something from it. This is not possible. Dr. Singh, he says, since scientists cannot see the spirit soul, they say it exists, its, its existence is very doubtful. So this is the whole thing. Dr. Frog in a well mentality. If I, I only can believe it if I see it. 
And sometimes even if I see it, I still don't believe it. Shiva Prabhupada, <clears throat> how can they see it? It's too small to see. Where is such seeing power? So again, this gets into the four human defects. And one of those defects is imperfect senses. We cannot see. Um, some of us, we're not like eagles. Eagles can actually see their, their meal five miles away in the air. We can't hardly see things five feet. Many of us have glasses, some wear cataracts. Um, uh, we need bifocals, maybe binoculars. And even if we have a microscope, we still can't see things, you know, like the soul. It's indescript from that standpoint. So it takes a level of spiritual education and then accepting things. Like we can see, Prabhupada uses this example um, that how other species have a living force in them. So he says, a dog mates, humans mate. Uh, a dog defends, humans defend. Um, dogs eat, humans eat. And then dogs sleep and we sleep. So why do we say that a dog doesn't have a soul? So we're seeing some of the same patterns. Actually, the dog feels pain. We feel pain. If you beat a dog, he'll scream. If you beat a human, they'll scream too. So there has to be some consciousness within that body, which indicates soul. Um, Dr. Singh, I'll go ahead. <clears throat> still, they want to, to uh, still they want to sense it by some means. Shiva Prabhupada says, if you inject some one grain, just one grain of deadly poison into someone, he immediately dies. No one can see the poison or how it acts, but the poison is acting nevertheless in the same way. The Veda says that because the minute particle called the soul is within the body, the whole body is working nicely. If I pinch myself, I immediately feel it because I am conscious all over my skin. But as soon as the soul is absent, which is in the case when the body dies, you can take the same skin and cut it and chop it and no one will protest. Why is this simple thing so hard to understand? Is this not detecting spirit? So we, we see that Prabhupada is speaking directly to the scientist that this is common sense. It doesn't take a lot of deep education to understand. It's just a, a, a matter of comparing these two things. We'll go on. Dr. Singh. That is the soul. But what about God? Shri Prabhupada says, first of all, let us understand the soul. The soul is a small God. If you understand the sample, then you can understand the whole. Now here is matter. Shri Prabhupada points to a dead tree with his cane. Formerly leaves and twigs were growing from this tree. Why are they not growing now? Can the scientist answer this question? Paradaradas says, uh, <clears throat> they would say the chemical composition has changed. Should have probably All right. Then if they are so advanced in knowledge of chemistry, they must supply the proper chemicals to make the branches and leaves grow again. Brahmananda Swami. Knowledge means that one must be able to demonstrate his theory. They should be able to show in their laboratories that life is caused by a combination of chemicals. Prabhupada says, yes. The scientific method means first observation, then hypothesis, and then demonstration. But these scientists cannot demonstrate their hypothesis. They simply observe and then speak nonsense. Now that's a really key point because that applies to just about everything. Um, 
So when you're doing this observation, you know, based on uh, uh, some hypothesis, you're, you're going to make this, this argument, <clears throat> then there's also the thing of trials. You have to test these things out to see whether or not they are valid. And of course, there's always some kind of miscalculation in matter. It, it, the Bhagavad Gita says um, there's always some type of fault in, in any endeavor. Um, Prabhupada goes on to say, scientists say that the chemicals are the cause of life, but all the chemicals that we that were there when the tree was living are still present and life energy is also there. There are thousands of microbes in the tree and they are all living entities. No one can claim that life, uh, that life energy is lacking in the body of this tree, Dr. Singh. Well, what about life energy of the tree itself? Prabhupada says, yes, that is the difference. The living force is individual and the particular individual living entity which was the tree has left. This must be the case since all the chemicals that are necessary to support life are still there, yet the tree is dead. Now that kind of reminds me, um, if anyone's familiar with, um, um, I'm trying to think if it's uh, B-51 bombers. So the B-51 bom bombers has a navigator, of course, the pilot, it has a gunner. Um, so they have all these living entities, but you can look at the pilot as the main source. So if the pilot happens to get a heart attack or he's shot or he dies, then the plane goes down. So this is what Prabhupada is intimating with the tree. Yes, there are the living entities there, but the tree there's a primary life force, just like um, in some references, uh, Krishna is referred to the soul of the universe. So he's helping things run. And so we are like corollary uh, components, or you can even use the demigods as, as uh, co-administrators. Uh, they carry out certain kinds of tasks. So yes, the difference is the living force is individual and the particular individual living entity, which is the tree has left. This must be the case since all the chemicals that are necessary to support life are still there, yet the tree is dead. Here's another example. Suppose I am living in an apartment and then I leave it. I am gone, but many other living entities remain there, ants, spiders, and so forth. It is not true that simply because I have left the apartment, it can no longer accommodate life. Other living entities are still living there, but it, sim it is simply that I, an individual living being, have left. The chemicals in the tree are like uh, the apartment. They are simply the environment for the individual living force, the soul, to act through. Thus, the scientists will never be able to produce life in the chemical laboratory. The so-called scientists say that life begins from chemicals. But the real question is, where have the chemicals gone from, come from? The chemicals come from life. And this means that life has mystic power. For example, an orange tree contains many oranges and each orange contains chemicals, citric acid and others. So where have these chemicals come from? Obviously, they have come from the life within the tree. The scientists are missing the origin of the chemicals. They have started their investigation from the chemicals, but they cannot identify the origin of the chemicals. Chemicals come from the supreme life. God, just as the living body of a man, produces many chemicals. The supreme life, the supreme Lord, is producing all the chemicals found in the atmosphere, in the water, in humans and animals, and in the earth. And that is called mystic power. Unless the mystic power 
of the Supreme Lord is accepted, there is no solution to the problem of the origin of life. So that reminds me of uh, Brahma Samhita, the very first shloka, shloka uh, 5.1. Ishwaraha Paramaha Krishna, Satchit Ananda Vigraha, Adade Adi Govinda, Sarvakarna Karna. So we understand Ishwaraha, which Prabhupada is indicating uh, here, th there has to be an origin. So this origin um, actually is the controller. Krishna, Ishwaraha Parama, he's, su he's supreme. Krishna is the supreme controller. And then he's Satchit Ananda Vigraha. He's full of knowledge, eternality, and bliss. And again, um, we talk about finding the origin. Krishna has no origin. Um, he, he has no beginning, rather, yet he's the origin, right? Adi Adir Govinda. Govinda. He has no beginning, yet he's the origin. And then he's the cause of all causes. Sarvakarana Karanam. So we see that Prabhupada is laying that out in this particular um, uh, paragraph. So Dr. Singh goes on to say, the scientists will re reply that they cannot believe in mystic power. Should Prabhupada responds, but they must explain the origin of the chemicals. Now, so some would ask, what does mystic mean? So if we break that down in terms of its, uh, you know, uh, root word comes from mystery um, or mysterious. That means we do not know. That's what mystic is. Things we do not know. They actually, they're, they're not readily available. But there's a practice that they become available. So Krishna is considered the supreme mystic, right? He's the supreme yogi. So he can do things that we can simply not understand, but there's a process there. Um, just like we, we, we see living mystics that are able to travel through the Ganges and go to other planets. That is a yoga process that people actually practice. So for those who don't know, it's called mystic or mysticism from, from that standpoint. So, uh, but they must explain the origin of chemicals. Anyone can see that an ordinary tree is producing many chemicals. They cannot deny it. But how does it, how does it, produ uh, how does it produce them? Since they cannot answer, this is, uh, they must accept that the living force has mystic power. I cannot explain how my fingernail is growing out of my finger. It is beyond the power of my brain. In other words, it is growing by inconceivable potency or achintya shakti. So this achintya shakti exists in an, or an ordinary being Imagine how much Achintya Shakti God possesses. The difference between God and me is that although I have the same potencies as God, I can produce only a small quantity of chemicals, whereas he can produce enormous quantities. I can produce a little water in the form of perspiration, but God can produce the seas. Analysis of one drop of seawater gives you the qualitative analysis of the sea without any mistake. Similarly, the ordinary living being is part and parcel of God. So by analysis, the living beings, we can begin to understand God. In God, there is great mystic potency. God's mystic potency is working swiftly, exactly like an electric machine. Machines operate by certain energy, and they are so nicely made that all the work is done simply by pushing a button. Simply, God said, quote, let there be creation, unquote, and there was creation. Considering in this way, the workings of nature are not very difficult to understand. God has such wonderful potencies that creation on his order alone immediately takes place. So on that point, another thing that Prabhupada is talking about, he is in, uh, trying to indicate the um, quality versus quantity. So we're qualitatively the same as the Lord, but 
we don't have the same quality. And so Prabhupada is indicating that, that, you know, his fingernails, his fingernails grow, but he's not like, you know, I don't really understand how that's happening, right? So we have a limited capacity um, to understand, but the way we take information is through the cyclic su su uh, succession. So Brahmananda goes on to say, scientists don't accept God or achintya shakti, Shita Prabhupada. That is their rascal dome. Um, that's an official word now, <laughs> rascal dome. God exists and his achintya shakti also exists. Karandar uh, says, <laughs> scientists say that life was created biochemically, Prabhupada says, and I say to them, why don't you create life? Your biology and chemistry are very advanced, so why don't you create life? Karandar, they say they will create life in the future, Prabhupada says. When in the future? If the scientists know the creative process, why can't they create life now? If life has a biochemical origin, and if biologists and chemists are so advanced, then why can't they create life in their laboratories? <clears throat> When this crucial point is raised, they say, we shall do this in the future. Why in the future? What, what, uh, what, uh, that is nonsense. To trust no future, however, however pleasant. What is the meaning of their advancement? They are talking nonsense. So Prabhupada is uh, unpacking something else here too. And it reminds me of <clears throat> if we work um, for state agencies or private corporal, not uh, private uh, corporate or nonprofit agencies, there's some kind of benefit package, 501. And it's the same thing. We are betting that <clears throat> our future is going to be very bright based on our investment. So it's also post dated, something in the future. Then we find that um, maybe as we get to retirement age, that the money that we thought that was going to be our nest egg actually is not enough to cover basic necessities. Or maybe the, um, the investment um, group has collapsed. You lose your pension, you lose this. Um, there's all sorts of things. Just recently we were hearing that they are saying, of course, they've been saying this for 30, 40 years, that the Social Security at some point is going to dry up. Now they're saying there's not enough money to fund Social Security. And so the question is that for the people who are currently receiving Social Security, or certainly for the people who are putting money into it. So we're investing something that there's no return. And so he's saying the same thing about scientists. They're investing in something that has no return. And why aren't they turning to um, the aspects of the creator in extrapolating knowledge? And that goes to why we come to this material universe in the first place. <clears throat> We're all trying to be uh, not, as Prabhupada said earlier, uh, God, or we can even say on a minute level, little God, we're trying to become the God. And so we have to experiment with things. So, but what we understand from the Vedas, um, nothing is needed to be experimented. It's known. These things are known. Now we may not know the, uh, the process of this, but th it's known. So Prabhupada has also stated that um, material life um, is basically means animal life. Spiritual life means human life. So you see the scientists are striving how they can become better animals so they can produce. And all this reproduction means, you know, I can live longer and enjoy my senses, you know, uh, more and more as opposed to understanding that enjoyment and the senses are relegated in spiritual life. Because there is, again, Dehi uh, Nu Ashman Yata Dehi Kaumaran Yabran Jara. 
tata diantara praptir, diras tatra vimuyati. So you can see this body is ever changing, but a sober person is not disturbed because he understands his constitutional position, that he's eternal, he's nitya. Uh, but some are trying to be nitya bandha. They're, they're trying to be eternally evolving or enjoying, and there's not much, you know, you can live a lot longer, maybe you live to be two, 300 years. These things were already done in the past. We already had an age Kriya Yuga or Sakya Yuga where you could live 100,000 years. The following age, um, Treta Yuga, you would live 10,000 years. The following age, Dwarpa Yuga, you could live 1,000 years. This is related to Methuselah. Um, and then in this uh, age, you know, we maximize our lifespan by 100 years. Um, but many don't even reach that. And then if you add on average the lifespan, which the, they omit, um, they omit um, um, uh, termination of embryos and things like that. The lifespan is actually very, very short. The only thing that they are accounting for is like now COVID cases, people who are uh, terminated from that, they're saying the lifespan is, is a little shorter and they do it according to your body. If you're black body, if you're this body, you know, they, they do it if you're female. So they, they do it according to that, but they don't look at the death rate with regard to um, uh, aborted fetuses. So <clears throat> in one instance, they're, they're trying to extend life. On the other end, they have so many mechaniz mechanisms to terminate life. We have so many mechanisms that we can't even conceive of that they use to terminate. So it's kind of a folly. So, so actually, who are they trying to preserve life for? Because it seems that everybody else appears to be expendable. So uh, Karandar goes on to say, they say that they are right, right are, are on, they are right on the verge of creating life. Prabhupada says, but that is also the future in a different way. They must accept that they still do not know the truth about the origin of life. Since they are expecting to be able to create life in the future, presently their knowledge must be imperfect. Their proposal is something like giving someone a post-dated check. Suppose I owe you $10,000 and I say, yes, I will pay you the entire sum with this post-dated check. Is that all right? If you are intelligent, you will reply, at present, give me at least $5 in cash so I can see something tangible. Similarly, the science cannot produce even a single blade of grass by biochemistry. Yet still, they claim that life is produced from matter. What is this nonsense? Is no one questioning this? We can prove that life began from life. Here is the proof. When a father begets a, a child, the child is living, and the child is it, it, and the child is living. But where is the scientific proof or the scientist proof that life comes from matter? We can prove that life begins from life, and we can also prove that the original life is Krishna. But what evidence exists that uh, a child is ever born out of a dead stone? The science, scientists cannot prove that life comes from matter. They are leaving that aside for the future. So <clears throat> again, Prabhupada is trying to kind of narrow this down and understanding the process. Um, you know, going to school, the process is, I guess for human beings, because uh, lately there are a lot of people who don't do this. They wake up in the morning, brush their teeth, take a shower, put on clean clothes, get their gatherings together and they, pro they you know, proceed on to school. Um, but some people that I've been hearing, some entertainers, oh, I don't take a shower. You know, I maybe shower once a week at that. Yeah, I don't think it's necessary to do that. So this is again, animal life. This is really animal life. So animal consciousness will produce animal conclusions. So. Basically, if you look at it, and we'll get into this a little bit, um, um, you know, the animals 
um, <clears throat> when they observe things in nature, it's through their senses. But the animals are heavily induced to see things from a basis of fear. So they're very fearful of everything. So uh, like Prabhupada would, would, would say, you know, you could, you could beat a dog. Uh, because he's trying to maybe get at your food or your chapati or whatever. And um, the dog will forget the beating. And then he'll come back and do the same thing again. So this is like these, uh, um, these scientists. They, um, they keep harping on the same thing, but then they're not willing to look at maybe some alternative because they've been at this a very long time. This is not new that they're proposing that... Um, Life comes from matter, but they again they haven't been able to produce anything, you know, from that. Some may argue, well, you have uh, test tube babies, but again they're using ingredients that are already there, and there's a living force, uh, just like in um, Prabhupada is inter, uh, is stated that the tree has chemicals, but eventually those chemicals dry up, right? So produce something from that. Um, you're going to get oranges from, from a tree that's dead. Those chemicals will dry up. So there has to be some uh, supreme force to produce the chemicals, to make those chemicals there. So we're being essentially maintained as, as souls. Like we can't actually, even though the living entity is in the body, we're not evacuating, evacuating on our own accord. We don't blink on our own accord. There are all certain types of administrators there that are orchestrating that. So the way we, the, even in the heavenly planets, when the demigod, excuse me, when the demigods um, vacate their bodies, the way they understand that, because they don't, they don't smell, they don't get old, their garlands usually dry up. So this is how they know. Um, so in our case, we're in a more gross situation where, you know, you have bodily fluids, we smell, we this, we have to go through so much stuff. But the scientists are thinking, you know, based on chemicals, you know, I can produce something. Uh, at best, maybe they produce a bad smell, but even so, uh, that still requires a supreme force. Uh, Karandara, uh, the basis of what the scientists call scientific integrity is that they talk only about what they can experience through their senses. Again, senses are limited, Prabhupada says. Then they are suffering from what they call Dr. Frog's philosophy. There was once a frog who had lived all his life in a well. One day a friend visited him and informed him of the existence of the Atlantic Ocean. Quote, oh, what is this Atlantic Ocean? Asked the frog in the well. Response, it's a vast body of water, his friend replied. How, how vast? Is it double the size of this well? Oh no, much larger, his friend replied. How much larger? 10 times the size? So in this way, the frog went on calculating. But what, <clears throat> but what was the possibility of this ever understanding the depths of the far reaches of the great ocean? Our faculties, experience, and powers of speculation are always limited. The frog was always thinking in terms relative to, to the well. He had no power to think out, uh, otherwise. Similarly, the scientists are estimating the absolute truth, the cause of all causes, with their imperfect senses and minds, and thus they are bound to be bewildered. The essential fault of the so-called scientists is that they have adopted the inductive process to arrive at their conclusions. For example, if a scientist wants to determine whether or not man is mortal by the inductive process, he must study every man to try to discover if some or one of them may be immortal. The, the scientist says, I, can I cannot accept this proposal that all men are mortal. There may be some men who are immortal. I have not yet seen every man. Therefore, how can I accept that man is mortal? This is called the inductive process. And the deductive process means that your father, 
your teacher or your guru says that man is mortal and you can accept it. So we have a little bit of time I want to use for some discussion because I, I know that you're all out there having thoughts and thinking and um, this is very, I always reread um, uh, the science of self-realization because I think it's one of the best preaching tools that uh, we can use to really um, help people understand the difference between um, uh, matter and spirit and what our constitution is. So uh, with your permission, if I can stop here, I can go on, but um, I just wanted to see if we can make this more uh, discussion oriented because I read a lot of stuff and probably takes a minute to digest this. So please, we'll, we'll open this up now and for discussion and we'll go from there. And let me switch back to uh, screen so we can get off this because this may be a little distracting for everybody. Okay, Mataji, are you still there? Yes, Prabhupada. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a nice uh, class and uh, thank you for sharing uh, um, all those uh, points, uh, Prabhuji. Very, very, uh, very useful. Yeah, as you said, it's like a preaching tool um, because uh, people have a lot of questions. Um, if you are able to answer them, that will be great. So that they'll also know what exactly is the main thing to understand. Yeah. Thank you, Prabhuji. So I request devotees if they have any questions or comments or realizations, uh, they can go ahead. I see Sri Davies out there. So she's always has her thinking cap on. So <laughs> maybe she's willing to talk for us. Hare Krishna, my dear Chandra Prabhu, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to our wonderful Guru Dev. My uh, humble apologies for joining about 15 minutes late. I just finished uh, the Sunday Feast lecture here at uh, ISKCON Ljubljana and I came running to attend your lecture. <laughs> but that's the only reason I was late. I was uh, listening very intently to the class because you have raised so many important points. And I was thinking how oh, Prabhupada is just smashing, you know, all this nonsense that scientists, you know, have come up with. But I was also thinking that people who are so bent on insisting that there is no God, no matter how many ways you try to present the philosophy, if they have made up their minds that they are not going to hear or they are not going to be convinced or they are not going to you know, be open, you know, they've just got that fixed idea. And however way you approach it, somehow it just doesn't sink in. So in such cases, should you just leave well alone and say, okay, take some prashadam and just go on to the other person who is probably a little more interested because you're just banging your head against a wall, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I I think that is a good, um, I think that's a good prospect to, Kind of leave it alone. Uh, however, I want people to understand many, this may be the case with many devotees. Well, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a bold statement. It is the case with every devotee that somehow or another, if not this lifetime, in a previous one, we were approached with philosophy. <laughs> we, we didn't get it, you know? Prabhupada has all these books out, right? And then later on, people get it. So we have to look, it's not so much that we have to convince them that day. Mm. Our job is to expose them. We have to plant the seed, right? Mm. Someone else may be doing the watering. Mm. We just plant the seed. We're seed planters. That's yeah. all we do. So we have to understand our role, right? And not be so upset that people are not getting it. And it's not like a race that, right. you know, we got to get this person and then I get credit. We have to understand Krishna knows and we're the instrument, right? So right. the more we surrender, they can either take it right away or better yet, there's, there's one uh, Prabhupada disciple. He was uh, uh, a Prabhu. I, I don't know him personally. I met him once and we didn't have a conversation with his Theravyatra. 
but he would say, you know, when they would do Harinam, the um, people would yell, hey, you guys get a job. You Hare Krishna's need to get a job. Don't want to, why don't you do something? You, just, you don't do anything. And, like, and then they mock the devotees by saying Hare Krishna. He says, or they would cover their ears. It's too late. You can't get it out of your ear. So the, the seed is already planted. That's one aspect. The, the other one is another angle. Now, sometimes it may be a friend that you're talking to that's like that, but they respect you. So here's generally what my process would go. I would consider talking about simply just the fallibility of material science. Look how it fails all of Look how they're always readjusting. They always mm -hmm. fail, right? They come and then they have a theory and then someone else comes up. Okay, you have uh, the Big Bang Theory. Then you have, you would probably remember this because most people don't, the oscillating effect. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, when I was in took, uh, physics uh, in the 80s, that seemed to be the most, the closest thing to um, expansion and retraction what we see with with the Lord in the universe. Then you had string theory. Then you had end theory. And then you had dark matter. <laughs> you, you know, they keep coming up. Well, we're going to do it. So it, again, it's just a post-data check, right? Yeah. Now, they may be close. It's kind of like, um, um, I was going to use this analogy too, that, and maybe if people make japatis differently, but I just follow a recipe. You know, you have your water, you have your flour, and you knead it, and then you do all the things, and then you let it sit for an hour. So sometimes when we're preaching to people, you got to let it sit for an hour. <laughs> you, know, you know, just just let it grow, what have you. It has to maturate. Because what will happen is, once it gets in their ear, they can't get it out. They have to formulate, even the atheists, or those people who are agnostic, or however they want to characterize themselves. But they're saying, but, 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 but they're always finding an objection. They just simply want to disprove what you say. They don't want to investigate whether or not it's factual. Because the ego, the false ego, Ahankara Vimudakma, this false ego is so situated that at any cost, I must be right. I must be right, right? So when they come in contact with devotees and devotees are, are, are giving this argument, Generally, how they respond, this person's intelligent. So if I defeat him, I must be more intelligent. <laughs> so you have those kind of dynamics that are going on that you also have to realize. It's not simply that they can't get it. It's more to do with their false ego. And it's more, even if they're, they're poorer than anything and couldn't get into university or anything else, or they couldn't get the professorship, or they couldn't get the grants or whatever it is, they have to have some sense of superiority. And that's the problem. They're trying to be supreme when they're not supreme. <laughs> so there's a lot of psychological, I'm coming through this from a psychological aspect that you have to understand. So the devotees, as they become more purified, they can start to understand psychology better, right? Applied spiritual technologies. <laughs> I'm going to plug in from a guru. So, so we have to understand that psychology. So when we get, and I, I wanted to do this and people are like, oh, well, you're reading from this, that, and the other, but this, these are books as well as they're, they're part of the Shutri, Suti. And so we have to be able to unpack this as well, because it's the common language that general people will understand. You mm -hmm. open up Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitam, whatever you open, you know, that's, you know, the words alone are going to intimidate them, right? Mm -hmm. But this common language, conversational, that we can understand it, that Prabhupada is trying to help us understand this, the psychology. And so those innocent people who are, are uh, victimized by compulsory education, because there's a whole lot of crap they tell you in compulsory education about origins, about where people come from, about how we are, this, that, and the third. There's so many things. We have to understand this conversational psychology with people and how their conditions. That's how we have to be able to analyze that 
to even enter a conversation how to preach to them. This is this we have to know. So there could be other things. It depends on the questions that are posed that we can start to understand how this person's thinking. Mm. Mm. I think I really like the point that you said that our job is to just give them, you know, the philosophy. After that, it's you know, we shouldn't be attached to the results. It's between them and Krishna, what happens from that point. But our job is to just simply be instruments and not worry so much about how much they're taking, when they will change, what will be their response, will they become devotees, this, that, because who knows, as you said, you know, it may take several lifetimes for that to happen. Just as we didn't come to Krishna consciousness in one lifetime, it took several lifetimes. Maybe they are on that journey and someday they will get to that point. And our job is to just be the best, um, best, uh, uh, best messengers, you know, to yes. be the best devotee we can be in under those. Because it's very trying, you know, to speak to such people. You feel like bonking them on the head, you know, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> this is attachment, though. This is our attachment. This is the adjustment we have to make. Because we're so fixed on some outcome, right? Mm. But it's, I'll use this, you know this in medicine, as you see symptoms, you prescribe things according to the symptoms. So if we give everything for a person who's not, and sometimes that's the case, we'll give this philosophy, they're not ready. So sometimes even Vaisheshya Prabhu would do, he would have just general comment, hey, what do you do? You know, well, that's really nice. Wow, you you know, you you do this, you're an athlete. So what? This is what salespeople do. One of the techniques of sale. It's not the product that they buy; they buy your personality. This is this is a common thing because I, I was in insurance, and people buy insurance, car insurance from me. They well, I've been with with Mike for so many years. You know, <laughs> you know for three decades. Why? Because I like Mike, not because he has a, there may be a better product, but what, what people pick up is that, like Prabhupada says also in the following chapter, the devotees are compassionate. Mm. So what, what people see that makes them want to be a part of something higher is they can get a taste. They get a higher taste because they see that Krishnanization that's in us. We're presenting Krishna because Krishna is there. We step back and let, allow Krishna to move forward. So that's the taste. That's what makes devotees attractive. What makes devotees, I guess it would be kind of hard to say they're devotees, but what makes us unattractive is we push our other aspects of our false identity. Right, our false ego and our desire to convert them and come bring them to Krishna and all our attachments actually make it less effective so yeah. this has to be done for me at least in that area because i really get frustrated sometimes with you know people who are so difficult to to reach so so, so yes and, and so when we become ishwara right mm -hmm. hum ishwara right <clears throat> we then we take on all the responsibility right mm -hmm. we must change we must be, then it becomes no you must dress this way no, you must put your shoes on this way. No, you must blink at this time. See, it becomes unending. This is what, because we have a perverted sense of what control is. Krishna's not like that. Krishna actually like, yeah, I'm just going to play in the forest. I got all my energies doing other stuff, you know, you know, and then, and you can see that. Let's use Indra as an example. When someone is rising, you know, you know, wow, this guy yeah, can take my place. <laughs> right. And that's right. the other threat. Then when we're preaching, I don't know if you've had this experience, that we cultivate someone, we bring him in, we preach to him, and then someone comes in and maybe they're preaching to him. And then we go, well, hey, hey, that's my person. I'm, I'm, you know, so we have to be very careful. You have to be very careful. See, there's a lot of things that we do, even though we're maybe devoted. But there are things we're doing, fault finding, uh, we're, we're territorial, you know, this is I, me, and mine, you know. Mm. <laughs> so all those things that it's not that like we're completely free from that because we're still we're still standing out. Maybe we have some charisma, 
you know, something like that, some attraction. We have one of those opulences and minute quality, and we start to exercise it. So we have to understand how to understand. We have to learn, know how to learn, right? And be patient with that with ourselves. And so we can always be self-reflective, look at ourselves and how we can present. Then, then we can see better effects. We can see what's going. Then we can see just because I, we have to have faith just because I say Hare Krishna, that it has an impact on that person. It does. Just like right. they said, just like if you go to you doing books, he says, you know, hey, you're too dumb. You're not going to understand these books, right? <laughs> and then they get angry. Then there's a fight. So those simple words, they're negative words. They have an impact. So just imagine now you're saying Hare Krishna. <laughs> and the impact it has on a person's consciousness. It's in there. We, just like Prabhupada said, we can't see it, right? But that's how the mystic mystic abilities of the supreme lord is working mm. yeah thank you i think mode of goodness you know striving for the mode of goodness rather than remaining in the mode of passion is very important especially for preaching so thank you very much for pointing all these things out i will reflect on them and yeah. thank you. mode of goodness is good but the is good even better, of course. <laughs> yes, but at least I must try for that. Then my devotional service will begin. <laughs> that, that's intelligence. Understanding where you are and where to start from. That's yeah. intelligence. That's actually more of goodness too. <laughs> Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you for mercy. Hare Krishna. Right. Uh, is anyone else? I see Madhavananda. My illustrious sister is on here. Uh, uh, Riswa Bhavan, Mohanasi, who else? I don't know, they may be just having it on, <laughs> not listening. <laughs> or, of course, I wouldn't fall, find fault with that. Hari Prasad Das, a lot of devotees. And by the way, I wanted to say, um, thanks, Hanja. Um, I wanted to say, I did, was able to watch a little bit of the it was way late, but early for me, of um, Prabhupada's appearance. Uh, I got the tail. I didn't get any of the kirtan, but I actually saw Sri Devi and Maharaj. And so that was, it made me hanker for wanting to associate with devotees that I've associated with before, but I'll leave it at that. So any, anyone else have any comments? Yeah, Mohanasini Mataji, um, you want to talk? Uh, yes. You want to ask it? Hey, Krishna Prabhuji, thank you for nice inspiration. I was listening to the lecture. I was uh, just thinking, uh, as you mentioned, like when you go on Harinam and sing Hare Krishna, uh, then I thought like maybe Krishna wanted uh, them to be there. And if even if they uh, uh, get furious or, or have uh, bad emotions about singing Hare Krishna, then Krishna keeps them, never forget him. Mm. Then yeah. maybe at the end of the, uh, life, they will again uh, remember him. Oh, I met these Hare Krishnas. They were singing, oh, this was so horrible. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. they will be purified and go back. Yeah, we, we all don't know where. There, the there is a reason. Yeah. There's a contract there, obviously. Uh, just like when I got started, I first saw two sannyasi, and I, I started laughing. I said, these guys, oh, they were in white bodies. So I said, these white bodies are so, they're weird. Because it was the, during the hippie age in the 70s. And then the joke's on me. I ended up <laughs> enjoying myself. <laughs> so uh, Krishna, he's, he has a great sense of humor. So um, when that kicks in for people, when the medicine starts to really distribute through the body, who knows? But, um, and whether you call it Krishna consciousness or Christ consciousness, as Prabhupada said, it's the same thing. Just, just about love of God, that's all. So thank you for your comment. I'm happy. For me, the best medicine was prasad, and that was what uh, brought me to Krishna consciousness. 
So I was not interested in philosophy. I was not interested in talking about Krishna. I like the music, I must confess. I like the music and I liked Prasadam. That's why I came to the temple always yeah. at the beginning. But yeah. that was 16 years back <laughs> already. Yeah. That's, there's nothing wrong I love with it. that. <laughs> Actually, that's intelligence too. I, I would never change for something else. I, I, I don't know anything better. <laughs> yeah. Jai, Hare Krishna. <clears throat> Hare Krishna. So I don't know if we have uh, enough time, but if we do, maybe there's one more comment and then we can, we can end. Yeah, uh, we can take, Prabhuji, if you have time. Um, yeah, if anybody have any more questions or comments. Uh... Yeah, I don't think any more questions or comments, Prabhuji. I think, uh, yeah, uh, it's a wonderful class once again. Thank you so much uh, for coming, for accepting my request kindly and uh, giving us class today. Uh, it's a good thing. It's a refresher, like uh, how we have to preach and uh, uh, what are the points we <clears throat> we have to remember. <laughs> so it's a good refresher. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I hate to miss any opportunity. <laughs> I would have been here yesterday too, but uh, I wanted to at least do something quality. I think that the devotees deserve yeah, that's uh, true. quality. Uh, Krishna consciousness. Uh, we shouldn't take it lightly, and and uh, so I, I always appreciate. <clears throat> uh, this is due to Chandra Mali's uh, mercy, and he travels. Then I get to speak. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, devotees. Thank you so much for joining. Vancha kalpataru bhyascha kripa sindhi bhavacha. Patitana pavana bhya. Bhya Vaishnava bhya namam. Oh. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare Krishna.